14, 15, 17, hello, 22 people, 25 people. Hello, 32 okay. people. Hello, 43 right. people. You see, we've got guests with us today. Uh, yeah. You may not immediately recognize them, but they are, in fact, actors from Red Dwarf. <laughs> as as yes. Or background team. So I'd like to introduce you to Donna Di Stefano. Hi. Played Kochansky in an episode we looked at a couple of weeks ago, but was also the incredibly brilliant. Uh, well, she was called the AFM. She was, in fact, the Stasi, the coordinator, <laughs> the mind commandant. Uh, she was the stormtroops. She was. <laughs> and Mike Agnew, of course, in the episode we're about to see, gave some of his best performances. So you were able to pick those out. <laughs> my best, some through. of my best limping ever. The, <laughs> the, uh, the floor manager and the AFM, you, you might see it in titles and wonder what they do. They basically do all the work. They run it. They run yeah. it. They run it. I mean, yeah. uh, the floor manager is the uh, eyes, ears and mouth of and hands and feet of the director and it really makes you wonder what the director's for right i knew that was coming i just knew that was coming <laughs> and and I yeah. just do what donna says and that's yeah. fine yeah. yeah i've let you down in this episode because i didn't notice the continuity error that's all right I must yeah. have been off doing something else. Well, yeah, you must have been on because you never, you yeah. never missed one. Yeah. Ed will explain when we get to it why he yeah. allowed this appealing continuity yeah. error to get through. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm particularly fond of this uh, episode. Because oh, Mike Agnew appears in, in Series 3 in the opening titles. Oh, you're in the opening titles next series, Mike. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> you might be, mate. Do I get repeats for that? Hi, Wales. Hi, Isle of Man. Sorry, you were saying. So it's a particularly good episode. I like it very much for two reasons. One is it's a genuine mystery. You really don't, un, you know, don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it yeah. slowly reveals itself. It's really good. And also, this is our first foray out onto location. And of course, we went the easy way by shooting at night, um, which is twice as difficult as shooting in the day, at a location that was an ex-rubbish dump landfill who, who that was found? on fire. Who found that location? <laughs> Actually, I think I think Donna and I, I think Donna and I were on our way back from having given up finding anything that looked like a lunar landscape. Yeah. We were on from real down, and then we found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's brilliant because they came to show it to me, and I, I, I looked at it, and I thought. A, this is good, it looks like a moonscape, and B, it appears to be on fire. And what it was, it's a landfill with rubbish underneath and the rubbish compressed and the heat starts and the fire starts underneath and it glowed through so the ground. So you did actually the film at night on a toxic waste dump yeah. which was yeah. on fire. Yeah, I, I mean, these days, I th I'm not sure. Donna, did you sign the health and safety certificate? <laughs> I don't know, I've written down in the um, hazard assessment form to actually get cleared to actually work on it. I think I must have lied. I think, I think you, you must have done it. A tiny bit. <laughs> and the thing is, the thing is, this was our, our very first, uh, as Ed said, our first outside broadcast filming. And I thought, oh, I've, I've arrived in the, in the full glamour of show business here in this yeah. stinking, burning mound yeah. in the middle of the night near you. There were, there were sort of iron posts sticking out of it that you could fall over and, and tear, your, tear your genitals off with. So we had to put plastic cups on those so you could see them at night. I mean, it really was a fairly miserable it. location. But boy, look at the results. I mean, clear, come on. You, you say this was the first because you actually shot this before you shot on Real Beach. Yeah, the... yeah. So uh, as I explained before, what we tended to do is we'd shoot all the exterior sequences before we went into the studios to shoot anything. So we'd shoot all the exterior <laughs> episodes scenes for all the episodes ahead of the game um, and some episodes that didn't have exteriors in them is probably because those scripts hadn't actually been quite finished by the time we got to the point where we were filming somebody's asking how do they get chat on an ipad and i'm not sure you can but if you can get it it's on your bottom if you just run the cursor along the bottom line you'll see a box saying chat if you click on that it should come up if it's not coming up it's because you're on an ipad i suspect yeah Okay, well let's get uh, let's get the show on the road. Literally, uh, and you can explain how Mike came to be dressed in Craig's uh, spacesuit. Yes, we'll get when we get to that. And also, Mike, can you point out which shots you're in? <laughs> I know which shots you're in. I believe I'm in. I believe I'm in every shot. Where he's got a helmet on. 
Excellent. Only three, Donna says. Only three. Only three. And you have to identify which of the two people with the helmets on is Mike and which one is you'll the find, other actor. Like this, inside a very small suit. <laughs> Lucy, <laughs> of course. Lucy Smith, you're dead right. We did confuse. I confused. It was my fault. BBC uh, in London is now partly flat. Uh, Manchester is still BBC. That made me very sad, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, I'm, guys. I'm glad Okay, chaps, let's let's get going. In press play in three, two, one, go. Brush going up. There you go. There you go. So, Mike, how many series did you work on? You were there on three, weren't you? I did series two and series three. Yeah. The best don't, ones. Don't obviously. forget. Yeah. Don't forget that the first year didn't really happen because of the. Age. Electrician strike. Yeah, we had to. Right. Yeah. So what I would right. four years on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 woman on it. Days of your life, Donna. <laughs> At least it's and more than two. Donna also, I should tell you, worked on Happy Families. The first time we all got together with Donna was on Happy Families. So. Oh, yeah. Would it be physically yeah. possible to paint in space? Yeah, I don't see why not. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Magnetic paint. Of course it's magnetic paint. Yeah. <laughs> magnetic paint sticks to the side of the ship, obviously. Thanks for the memory. On the DVDs it's called Thanks for the Memories and that worried me. But it was Thanks for the Memory. Yeah. But Bob Hope's song is Thanks for the Memories, right? <laughs> Thanks for the Memories. We'll tell you a story about uh, Robin and, Rob and I both know um, our favourite story about uh, Bob Hope. We'll tell you at the end of this. It's a, <laughs> We both independently had heard this story. I uh, will tell you later. So we're outside, having fun. Wait, no, we're still in the shaken vac. Oh, we're shaken vac. Now shaken we're outside. Head. Now we're outside, are we? Okay. It's quite smoky. Did we have a smoke machine? I don't remember the smoke. Yes. That's, that's probably just the fire. Yeah, that's the fire from underneath the ground. <laughs> we did have smoke machines as well. Yeah, we did. Oh, and that prop cake was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to transport, obviously, the uh, Rimmer's cage out to the location. And uh, it's, not, it's actually quite well lit, this. That's, that's not all from the fire. That is also, that red light is, is provided guys, by the, the OB unit. What's the idea with the light be in the cage, guys? Is that... Uh... He couldn't travel outside the ship if he was a hologram. His, in theory, his, his power would, would disappear. So he had a mobile unit so that when he's some, somewhere else, he could still be there. Is that right, Rob, more or less? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. But you abandoned that concept later on, I think. It was too, yeah. too limiting. Yeah, well, I think we did in backwards. Yeah. yeah. He got an upgrade, OK? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You got an upgrade. So it looks pretty there, doesn't it? The mixture of the, some of the wide shots mixed up with model shots with Blue Midget and Red Dwarf in the back. And the lighting, yeah. It, uh, oh, this is one of my favourite jokes of all time. Where are we? My, my phone keeps freezing. Where are we? Are we inside Blue Midget? No, we're still singing Happy Death Day to you. Uh, happy Death Day, yeah. No, we're in the, we're in the um, cabin um, quarters. Well, I, you're spoiling yeah, it for I'm me, so you. now I know where we're going next. <laughs> <laughs> this was the night uh, Craig's uh, first son was born, wasn't well, it? Here, it here was. lies the secret, yeah? So tell us the story, Mike. Or, you got the news well, on the middle of the night. Got, we got to about, uh, I think we got about half past 12, one o'clock in the morning when uh, the, uh, this is the mid 1980s, the uh, prehistoric mobile phone that I had sitting on the top of my car on a piece of uh, tin foil to make sure I got a signal rang, which it never rang because I didn't know anybody else with a mobile phone. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it was in fact, Kathy Tyson, who was Craig's wife uh, then, um, who was actually in labor. And Craig hadn't mentioned it to us. No, no, we, no. We, uh, Did, he know? Well, Did he know, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. 
taxi company, <coughs> and um, and they sent a car and sent him down to London uh, for what was at the time probably about quarter of the budget of the program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so he had, and he dashed and actually ended up being a fraction late, I think. Fractionally late, but of course, in the interim, with Craig gone, somebody had to take his place. We drew yes. straws, won, and Mike got it. And uh, so he had to don on the spacesuit and become Craig. And being about six or eight inches taller than Craig, yeah. it wasn't the most comfortable of evenings. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to still run the floor. Obviously, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and cue me. <laughs> cue you, Mike. Okay, where yeah. are we now? Are we are we in the sleeping quarters yet? Yeah, uh, Ooh, Holly's just come on with his, his night hat on. His night cap on, perfect. Okay, I'm in the right place now. Sorry about that. Rachel wants to know who came up with the triple... Well, me. We, <laughs> that, that was a great hangover cure. You probably all tried it. No, I haven't. Yeah. It's fantastic. No, yeah, it's really good. Recommend it. Okay. I think I must have given him a runny egg. <laughs> I think you did. I think you yeah. did, Donna, on purpose. <laughs> no, I should have given him a half egg, but I didn't. But he's like this, holding it away when he didn't drink up in his costume. Another fantastic invisible. That's where uh, the way you do invisibles, like sandwiches appearing in somebody's hand, is that the actor has to freeze. Donna runs in, sticks a sandwich in his hand, runs out. And we go action, and I cut the difference out in between the two. But you have to be absolutely still. So if you had dripped mm. some egg on him, Donna, it would have screwed the whole invisible. No, yeah. it, it, it appears in his hands, and then he goes to the yeah, and you, and yeah. I think one of the secrets with those invisibles, if you're doing those at home and you want to cut something out and uh, make it animate with something else in the picture, is as soon as you... The point to cut is the fraction before somebody moves, and then you can't quite see if there's a if there's a jump. It's on a movement if you can. Go handy tip number two. No, we haven't like that. I'm glad we had all the technology to do it, Ed, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, there's another episode which uh, Mike also appears in in another uh, another episode called Backwards, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and actually, Mike acting backwards is quite remarkable. One of my favourite <laughs> shots. And still, still one of my favourite credits is Git in Pub. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> is that where you're in the title sequence, perhaps, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, it might, if it might be. This <laughs> scene, by the way, is, is six minutes long. Mm. It's quite mm. interesting. It must be yeah. one of the longest scenes in Red Wolf. Yeah, it's a very long scene. It's a very good one, though. It is. Not... You're sort of really getting to know them a bit now, aren't you? Yeah, and I think that Craig's attitude in this is really good. He sort of like doesn't really want to know because he does know that he's going to regret this entire conversation later on. <laughs> um, Actually, what it was like working with the Chuckle Brothers. They were brilliant. The Chuckle Brothers were brilliant. They liked <laughs> oh, me. Like they were good guys, Donna, weren't they? Oh, well, we were saying, weren't we? Uh, Rick, Rick used to love the Chuckle Brothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He didn't like so, many. So, Donna, um, every week I mention the yellow banana that's in the set. Oh, um, God. Just wanted to point out, it was just a nightmare for you because it never, ever stayed still. It was always floating <laughs> about. And there it is. There's the yellow no, banana. I never, no, I always try to put it in the same place. Yeah, I know, but some, uh, in the early days, because of the air conditioning in the studio, it used to float about. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, you say he was touring as, as a magician, James. Yeah, he, he appeared in Benidorm for us as a magician. Yeah, you know, that season of Benidorm a couple of years ago. Yeah. Banana watch, Molly. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, we did try to blue tack it down. But, you know. <coughs> Sorry, I got you all watching the banana again. My fault. Where's the guitar? There was a guitar by the poster as well. It should be there. You were not in production, Donna. You don't have to worry about <laughs> <laughs> But that's what she would do. I've she would do that. guitar is missing. I've got no um, memory of that jigsaw. So what happened to the Red Dwarf jigsaw, I wonder? I don't know. But I know that I would have had to have built it up. Yeah. You would be the person who built it to the point where it was yeah, ready. It was yeah. Probably, yeah. Which is one. I don't yeah. what happened to it. Very, very it's no wonder you didn't have time to blue tack the banana if you were having to do that jigsaw. <laughs> <in the side. laughs> 
Um, yeah, I would have liked that jigsaw, particularly in lockdown. Yeah, it's taking you ages. <laughs> <laughs> black. Uh, oh, it turned up at an auction, did it, David? Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry, Mike. The reason we get sorry made the jigsaw was it was more than twenty pieces. Ed, the rest. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> You're right. Donna, we were asking in a previous week. Remember the when he's when Crichton paints the picture of Lister on uh, of Rimmer on the toilet. Yeah. Whatever happened to that picture? That turned up in an auction. Did it? Mm. Put it I put everything into storage, and I collected all the scripts, all my paperwork, mm. and put that into storage. I don't know where it's gone. Well, you put it into BBC Storage, which is another well, word for crime syndication <laughs> club. <laughs> but Donna, you have got a very special memento, haven't you? I have, but it's downstairs now. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, I think you haven't got it with you. Go and get it. it go and get it. Go and get it. We'll cover for you. We'll cover for you. OK, let's all talk about Donna. <laughs> I'll tell oh, the fact. Donna, she was a nightmare. <laughs> I do understand the fact. Where is it? <laughs> Lovely model top of the uh, over the top of it. No, here she comes. <laughs> that is that is radio effect step going, isn't it? What is going on there? That's uh, Mike doing Donna running up and down the stairs. So it's the following morning. A hint here. Look, he's in his pajamas. And wasn't he completely canned the night before? Look at that. Look what Donna's got. Don't go round to her house and steal it. <laughs> <laughs> We don't know where she got it from. No, we have no idea. There I've it been, is. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a scale model. <laughs> oh, what I wouldn't give for that, honestly. <laughs> but she doesn't keep it at the house, folks, just so you know. No. <laughs> it's under lock and key in a safe. Yeah. <laughs> She's going to put it into storage at the BBC, so expect to see it on no, the I'm any day now. Storage at the BBC. Oh, on. apparently somebody's found the jigsaw. Oh, oh. yeah. There oh. you go, look. You can buy the jigsaw. I can't see oh, right. it yet. I might order Oh, it. yeah. Well, it's on eBay. Um, what's the right. Okay. Oh, so it's the following morning now. And look, the broken leg business is beginning to make its appearance. Um, it's, it's going for 350 quid. Ray has got the cast on his left leg. And the yeah, cast the, got that, the cast on the right leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was some cast mixed up at some stage. And I'm not talking about the actors. The, um, yeah, the hints, clever hints that he's in his pyjamas and Craig's in different clothes, so, you know, it can't be the next morning. And the plaster casts are on the right legs at the moment, are they? The correct Yeah, legs. they're on the right legs at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The trouble with these casts are they're very clever. They're made of rubber, so you could slide them on and off. Yeah, but the um, thing is that... mean it took them off too often. Everybody was supposed to watch their own continuity makeup wardrobe, me, the PA, the director, no, no, I not. No, no, no. I, um, yeah, okay, yeah. You, all right, you you think the actor could remember which leg he'd had the cast on, wouldn't you? <laughs> you would think. We should have written it on their leg. This <laughs> leg. In the heat of the moment, um, things might have been missed anyway, because I probably took Craig to the gate, which is far, far away, to get to the road to get the taxi. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think the casts are right. I think it's when the thing drops it drops on the wrong foot isn't it now you know i think it took three years for everybody to blame me for dropping <laughs> <laughs> mike i went to at one stage i managed to get away with it by saying that it was a double memory and uh, oh no sorry this is not the wrong foot there's another continuity area a massive one which there's is another memory. Hole, which you which i'm sure the the uh, the viewers know about i'll point it out when we come to it I tried to pretend that it was a double double memory and therefore they hadn't broken their legs. It lasted for about eight seconds before I was found out. Donna? Yeah. I believe you flipped it in the edit to make it look like you made the right to make the right choice and in fact it was the opposite. Yeah, it was worse than that. There's a shot with where they neither of them have castle and they should Oh that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up soon, folks. Hey, Donna, who writes the words above the bunk? From Charlotte Edmonds, she wants to know that. Me, I would get graphics to do it for me, and graphics would make things up. And who signed the cast? No, they both haven't got the cast on here. No, but when they when they're signed, who signed them? Who so it was me and I. Oh, you'd have done that, Donna. Yeah. People to do it as well. Pretty much anything that was happening in the studio was, was done by Donna, basically. Yeah. 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 You used to leave me on my own. That was 
why? I was the only one working from Manchester. And you were only working from Manchester. Come back up the next weekend. She's got this <laughs> long rubber cast yeah, all true. scribbled on. Mike, when he was there, sorting the props out, doing the floor managing. Oh. Fart in a jacuzzi. Good line, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice model shot here. This was good. And also the opening model shot for this episode was nice. So this. <coughs> oh, uh, that's, that's not called for Spanish television. No, that was that was low. Well, was this part of a novel originally, and then adapted into um, into TV? Nick's asking. Probably at one stage, but not for long. It, it I think it's a good sort of novel story, you know, because it's now. Novel. There's a shot. Sorry, this folks. Thing. They should be wearing cast in that shot, and they're not. <laughs> oh shit! All that one. <laughs> All that one. Um, my error. Entirely my error. Oh, they got cast on. <laughs> oh, you remembered. You remembered. Yeah. Have they keep going on about me confiscating? Ah, uh, now the they're on. Norman. Yes, I did confiscate the ball off Norman. Yeah, now they're on. So um, that was a that was small good. error. But why they bothered to take a huge, great gravestone down? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now wasn't that me doing my Olivier pointing there? It might have been. Yeah, it might have been. You're on a different scene from me. I'm on, I'm back in the studio now. On the All right. Grid. Are you ahead of us? Ah, oh, sound effects courtesy of Jem Whippy. Thank you very much. When you open up the red, the black box. So, Donny, you had to take away the football to stop them playing football when they had the casts on their legs, yeah? Yeah. No, oh, in the rehearsal rooms. Yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. With all those metal poles <laughs> of doorways, and I come in, and the three of them are playing some football. Yeah. <laughs> but then he doesn't tell people that he actually strained his ankle. Luckily, he's not in vision. Yeah. And I have to do first aid on him and everything, wipe it up in the accident report book. It's and like the English, English cricket team all over again, playing yeah. football just before the match. Yeah. So, we managed to get a nice high angle camera there. I can't remember how we did that, Mike. Did we strap it to the top of the, the scenery? We couldn't have had a crane in for those high angle uh, security yeah. angles. Good shot, that good comedy shot when they, uh, they're yeah. doing it behind his back. Yeah. yeah. So, that, those high angles, that we must have just attached the camera to the top of the set. Or oh, maybe we put it on a, a lighting pole. Yeah. Anyway, it's not moving. It ain't just got him in shot. <laughs> So we had to put replay here so we could go back into colour so that we'd still know we're in the past but, in, um, but managed to hold colour. Coming up now, ladies and gentlemen, is possibly one of the worst chroma key scenes we've ever shot. And the reason being is that I should have shot them. And if you see them now, I don't know if you're in the same place as me, but we're now in the hologram centre. And in the background, I should have shot it against chroma key blue, but I didn't. And so the fringing around the, uh, the key is awful. But... Again, my fault. You'll see it when you cut to the wide shot. I'm, I'm, I must be well ahead of you lot. There, so you can only can see the wide shots now. Lots of shots yeah, of them are in the background. Yeah. But the, uh, the keying around the edge of the two guys is pretty awful. But it's nice to get that compilation of Chris in the background. Lots and lots of multi-passes in the edit. Went down to about eight generations of tape to get. I don't think it looks that bad, eh, honestly. Which is amazing because I mean nowadays you just layer it in, but we had to degenerate the tape. Yeah, yeah. Tape to get that kind Absolutely. Of I mean, what we did, I think, is we shot it with the with the screens in the background, and then I had to put something into each of the screens. And every time you did that, there's another generation. So right. it it started to get worse and worse and worse. But yeah, no. Now these days, piece of cake. I love the way she says, I love you, Rimmer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not Arnold, yeah. <laughs> so where did we get Lisa Yates from? Um, I think... I don't know, is it, uh, it wasn't probably... I know I booked a lot of people, but I didn't book her. So. She is now, by the way. Yeah. She lives in LA and she's a motivational speaker, Samra. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I think so. I think I'm right. Wow. There you go. So there's that. No, yeah, it's a nice composite shot. <laughs> right on my phone. Oh, this is really now, Chris doing Craig. <laughs> 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 okay. 
So where are you, Don, at the moment? And I can tell you what to do. Wh which part of the show are you at? I'm at the part where he's boasting now about having um, sex with her. In right, we, we've just got him caressing himself like that. Right, right. So yeah, if you... well, I'm just about a minute ahead of you then. So if you pause for a second, we'll tell you when we get to your bit. Nick Hopkins, Ed, is saying that uh, Lisa Yates bumped into uh, you and Ruby at a party in LA a few years ago. Really? Yeah. Oh. She said she bumped into Ruby and Ed at a party a few years ago. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Try playing now, Donna. You should be all right. What are you up to? <laughs> Call me Tiger. Yeah. We're, we're a little bit ahead of you now. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, call me Tiger. Uh, oh no, I didn't realise that that we met her in LA. I must. Uh, um, I'll ask Ruby about that and see if we can remember. I've always been fascinated by uh, memory. This is kind of the first uh, bit I ever did about it, really. But mm. when you think about it, we kind of are our memories, and that's why it seems so terribly cruel that you start to lose them as you get older. <laughs> and. Uh, if you had somebody else's memories, would you be different? That's, that was kind of what I was, uh, it's plagued me throughout my writing life. <laughs> um, question for Ed. Sounds like every day was a bit of school days for you on Red Dwarf. How much did you learn and take forward and how much were you winging it? Well, we didn't wing any of it really. It was all pretty carefully planned. Every shot was nailed down to the ground really. Otherwise we would never have been able to get this kind of stuff done. Had to be really precisely planned. Um, very, very little improvisation in it at all. It was all tightly scripted. In fact, as sitcoms go, I would say this was the most locked down because of the constant technical requirements. They, the actors had to be absolutely spot on, both words and positions and movement mm. and so on, because you're constantly cutting funny stuff around them. Yeah, it's very, it was very disciplined. And all you used to do is, <clears throat> there's a thing called a camera script, which is basically where it defines where all the shots are and where, where they come and at what point and what time. And then that was like the Bible. I had to work on that till about two or three in the morning to get it absolutely nailed. So everyone knew exactly what was happening. Donna. I would block the moves yeah. for you to put in your camera shot. Yeah. yeah. So when we we're in rehearsals, Donna on her script would just would write down who's moving where, when, what time, what, on what line they moved and everything else so that um, it could remind me exactly where's who and which, which is the best camera to put them on. But it was very tight, very precise. It has to be, otherwise we'd never got it done. <laughs> Popcorn. <laughs> now that's the overhead shot you were talking about again, Ed, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Alan, Alan's now <laughs> saying he meant in terms of uh, how much oh. you were winging it in terms of ambition. In, uh, in ambition? Yeah, just never saying, no, we can't do that. I don't know if you ever said Oh, that. I see. I, I only said, no, we can't do that to one. Oh, Mike's got something. Right. Well, yeah, sometimes I remember Ed and I spending hours, sometimes hours, working out how the hell we are going to do this. And me wishing that occasionally Ed would just say, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the... Um, yeah, the underwater episode that was said no to straight away, wasn't it? Which was that? The underwater episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but there was one. Can we do a whole episode in a swim pool underwater? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, the underwater episode. There was one script that came in at the beginning, had all cast riding on giant locusts, I think, approaching rubbish land. I do remember going, sorry, no. <laughs> Nowadays we would, of course. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I know a lot of people really actually think this is one of the best Red Wolves, if not the best Red Wolf ever. And I think it's a combination of the mystery, which is a really good mystery, and the, you're really winkling away at what makes them tick here. The, the list of rimmer scenes are just really, they really cut deep, don't they? Yeah. The writing yeah. goes to a deep psychological level time and time again, doesn't it? About what love is, about who these characters are and what motivates them you know to, to put to put Lister's attitude into Rimmer's brain is an extraordinary yeah, thing to absolutely. do absolutely so Mike which do you think is the most complicated scene we did that we in had? the whole of Red Dwarf yeah in Red Dwarf 
I mean, there was one where they had to step into into. They had to step in, into a, a, a slide screen and then appear yeah. in the slides and interact with that. That was kind of complicated. I remember thinking, we've <laughs> done this before. <laughs> the most difficult one was the throwing the snowball through the photograph, through the projection That's screen. It. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. We had to work out on location yeah. which what lens you were using, mm -hmm. exactly how far they were away from the lens, so that then when we shot on the Jesus. inside, the perspective yeah. looked the same when they were projected, but they weren't really projected because it yeah. was blue screen. Yeah. But I could then have the deep joy of standing with ice cream until I hit Craig Charles in the face. <laughs> <laughs> a magic I moment for you. Michael Donner, why did you leave after the third series? I guess it was because we moved to London and, and you were you were Manchester-based, Donner, anyway, yeah? Yeah, I was told that I, I have to not do it anymore, let the boys grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that I, um, I was fired. Uh, no. no. <laughs> you were not. No, I wasn't. Um, I think, I think um, you had another project for people. <laughs> I remember what it was. Well, I think you joined No Gay TV by then, Mike, and you were directing for us, weren't you? Uh, yes, because we were doing all that stuff at BSB at the time. Yeah, we had a big contract with B Sky B. We were making about eight hours a week, and Mike came over to us and started working as a director. Mm. I think I did three of them, yeah. And me mm. too. Yes, you did, darling. What to you? No, well, because I couldn't make television without Donna. Bloody so hell, Donna, I'd forgotten that. Mm. That, um, was, that was a good week in Edinburgh, wasn't it? Up your news. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the most fantastic weeks ever. I played golf every morning and went to work at midday. It was that great. That was literally a no sleep weekend. Uh, week. All right, no wonder I wasn't on it then. Um, I, I'm well, quite I sad thought... we didn't see the observation dome set in more often. It's kind of nice yeah, that mood. I was just about to say the lighting on the observation dome is very good too. They lit from underneath, which was always nice. It sort of gave it a sense of that they really were up somewhere. I don't know why. I love the music on that scene as well. Oh God, how? Okay, happened? which one's you, Mike? Um, I'm looking at a two shot now. I've got. I've just. Right, I'm the one uh, hopping on the left, I think. Right. Oh yeah, you can tell you're crouched down. I'm the one who <laughs> dropped it on the wrong foot. There we go. Bang. There you go. Wrong foot. Never mind. <laughs> I don't. Think and that's I, not me. That's not. The, here, here comes the break now. Right. I've got them coming into the sleeping quarters. Yeah, so have I. There's a bit of yeah, That's when I said, that's not me. Right. <laughs> so they rip out the pages of the diary. Mystery and told. the lovely little end. Yeah, and this was actually slightly more complicated to shoot than I thought. That, interestingly, was quite hard to do. You Going from this jigsaw to the actual titles was quite tricky. You can do it thing. now quite easily, but good luck. Very Lord. easily, but that time you had to sort of pick the picture back, put it here, move it left, move it right, and move it up, and then try and get it fixed into the screen and then yes. animate at the right moment. Yes. And, uh, and then the whole screen had to come up. And don't forget, in the edit, we had uh, Yian using the cock spots. So... Yeah. Yeah. That made it easy. Not oh, because Joe Sharples or Ian Symes, whichever of you it is, why did he leave the jigsaw with just one piece left in the first place? Well, aren't you a killjoy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just so happens that they yeah, had to Yeah, because that's an ending, guys. That's how you do an ending. But isn't it also <laughs> that they were filling their quarters while they were telling the stories and breaking the ankles? Thank you, Donna. Very that good. The, in fact, correct Very good. the real reason. Very good. Very good. It um, is funny, Ed, because you look at that end, that's something you just literally do. Mm. You say you wouldn't think anything of it, would you? No, no you, could do it in, you could do it in 10 minutes, but it took ages. And actually, I have to give a big shout out at this point to Ed Wooden, who edited uh, these shows brilliantly. And I mean, what I was stuffing into his edit, we'd never really done before. I go, well, this happens here. And he, you know, the sequence that Mike, Mike was talking about with the screens and snowballs and everything else and he always took everything on board and went right let's see if we can make this work and sometimes i give him stuff that didn't work and he would make it work and so um big shout out to, to ed wood i mean again well, i say well i talk about having fun through the night in edinburgh but we used to work through the night ed never cared did he mm. 
No. Locked in there. No. We'd, we'd go on till four or five in the morning five sometimes. In the morning. And the same thing in the dubs as well with Jen. Was, uh, four or five in the morning. Absolute... He used to go on for four days. He, he was an absolute men shed. He didn't care what his timesheet said. He just got it done. If you're still out there, Ed, and I think you are good on yeah. you, mate. You did, yeah. you did three of a kind with me and Young Ones and this, and you, you made a huge contribution. Mate. Well, you get a, a, a really close relationship with an editor, don't you? Because yeah, you, you do. You're there, locked if away for film, hours. If you're on film, your film cameraman, your DOP is... Yeah. You know, your right arm but in uh, on electronic on digital you, you you've got very important people all around you but eventually you sit in that edit suite with you and the editor hmm. normally just the two of you edit would have been yeah, yeah. And, and quite often you know you could spend 45 minutes on one edit just trying to get it right yeah, just one cut um, yeah they were really really good and, and ed was brilliant and he trained up mark mark wyborn who went on to carry on doing this well, and, he, he, he and really, you know he's still a friend a great friend Really I think the thing to remember about these episodes as well is they were, they were all shot on one inch tape, yeah. Yeah. which um, didn't mean that you just put another disc in or zipped yeah. through the memory. You actually had to go out, um, get find find the tape mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the in the corridor that yeah. had someone's sandwich on it, then put it, bring it back in, lace it onto the machine to spin it forward to a time code to then add that edit in to then take that tape off and put another one on. Yeah. So it was a long, laborious process. It was um, a very long, laborious process. And sometimes I would volunteer to change tapes from, for Ed. Uh, and then what you're supposed to do is you put the tape on and you twist the thing in the middle, which locks the tape into place, because when it's spinning fast forwards or backwards, it gets extremely fast. But of course, when I did it, I forgot to do that. The tape <laughs> spun round, flew off the spindle and buried itself into oh the wall. <laughs> With all that tape on the floor. Yeah, I was banned after that oh. from changing tapes. I've got to tell you, there's one <coughs> that we say you have to go down generations to, uh, mm. to create all these effects. There was one thing you could do once uh, with the old tape, and that was to actually cut, physically cut the tape, like you do when you're sound editing with sound tape. Yeah. But on a videotape, it's incredibly dangerous mm. and complicated because you get one frame wrong and you've got a jump cut that you can't fix. Yeah, Wood Wooden was one of the very, very few people who ever dared to do it. Mm. You used to have to go and get a special big block, yeah. look through a microscope, and you could see not the picture, but you could see the little time dots where the frames come. He'd take a razor blade, and I remember him doing it the first time mm. with me, saying, Paul, you, you do understand, if I've got this wrong, we can't retrieve it, I've just cut the frame out. Yeah. And he cut the frame out, slip the other thing in, put the sellotape on, pasted it together. Uh, but cutting cutting videotape was a horrible, dangerous thing to do. But yeah, it, really dangerous. I, I'd thing. never heard of it. I'd never. Heard yeah, of it. yeah. They used to be able to do that. Did, when they shot on, did, remember Paul going back before Red Dwarf to things like the Two Ronnies and things we shot on two inch. Yeah, and that, and that would quite often be cut. Well, with the really right. we did used to have yeah. to do it, but yeah. very few people in the whole of the BBC yeah. could do it, and Edward would do it. And then the difficulty with one inch was that it was multi-generational. So every time you made an, an edit and you wanted to go back and fix something else, you had to drop a generation. And every time you dropped a generation, you'd drop quality and it was, you know. And, uh, and at least the one inch was slightly better quality. But on, right. on two inch, on the, what, we did the two runnies and those kind of things, right. you couldn't go down more than two or three generations. It would all start to blur and fuzz. And, yeah. Yeah. My, so can tell you quickly the Bob Hope story. Sorry, Rob, did you want to... Just somebody's asking Mike what episode it was he nearly had his head mashed in. <laughs> Splicing film, Alex, you're dead right. Um, in the film too. If it was by Ed, probably almost every episode. Uh, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't remember that. When did I mash your head in? That's not true. Charlotte, you're right. When they talk about oh, scenes on the cutting room really? floor, they're talking about film, of course. because From a falling film. prop. With a falling prop. A falling <laughs> prop. I'll come back to you, Charlotte. Do you know, I'm so sorry. Ed, Ed, Rob's been talking about memory and, uh, <laughs> and how, how divine and wonderful it is. And uh, this is 35 years ago. I, I don't remember a falling prop. Well, I, remember, because, I know I, why you don't remember, because a prop fell on I your head. Head. <laughs> Charlotte was saying some time ago that it's, it's why we talk about scenes being on the cutting <coughs> floor. Yeah. That really refers to film. When you're working with film, you can literally you cut do it. Literally, yeah. it's, because it's, it's just a succession of pictures, so you can cut it 
it's quite clear where the frame comes. It's quite an easy thing to do. And of course, the bits you don't use, you chuck into a bin and they get carted away for, for rubbish. So when we say a scene's on the cutting room floor, it did literally mean that. But that's when you're shooting on film, not when you're shooting on videotape. And when you're okay. shooting on film, one of the things is that you, you do a, there's a negative and then you get a print of that and you edit off the print. But eventually when you've got your edit together on film, it needs to go back to the negative and then some Imprinted. poor bloke who has to have counselling about once a week does what's <laughs> called the neg cut. Okay, and yeah. That is the negative that's cut. And once you make a mistake on that, you can't go back. <laughs> so on the film thing, you've got that same decision of cutting the thing every time, but at least you can actually see yeah, the frames. you can see it, where is it? Yeah, exactly, where is it? You, you can't. When Ed wouldn't put his razor on the thing, he was going blind. He couldn't see anything at all. Yeah. So guys, the, the Bob Hope story that both Rob and I had heard on the circuit, when Bob Hope was a young comedian, I mean, listen, I actually was lucky enough to see him at the London Palladium, one of the absolute great, uh, up there with Jack Benny and Claude Burns and those extraordinary American comedians. Although, you know, one hears that he wasn't the nicest guy in, in the real life, but an absolutely consummate comedian. But when he was a young man, like all those uh, variety stars, he used to tour America all the time. That's how they made their money. They toured around America. And he was a very astute guy, Bob Hope. And he occasionally, if he liked the look of a town, He'd, he'd go and knock on an estate agent's door the next morning after he'd done the show and say, just take me out, show me a property somewhere on the edge of town, somewhere out in the suburbs. And he'd have a little look around, pick a nice little plot, and he'd pay cash, normally roughly what he'd made the night before, and he'd buy that house. And after a few years of doing this, Bob Hope had property in the centre of most of many, many cities in the US because, of course, <laughs> they were growing so quickly at that time. And he'd twig this. He bought these little suburban properties and within five years, they were in the centre of these growing cities. So he had a very big problem. Yeah. I had a great story. I once uh, was working with uh, Bob Monkhouse, who was, used to write for Bob Hope when Bob, he was yeah. coming over here. And he said that they were uh, on a plane and he was writing uh, some gags for him. And, and, and Bob Monkhouse went to the toilet on the plane and uh, he's sitting on the loo. And there's a knock on the door and Bob Hope says, uh, are you riding? <laughs> and Bob Munkow says, I'm on the toilet, Bob. And uh, Bob Hope says, well, there's paper in there. <laughs> he was a hard driver to work with. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. wonder why you uh, never shot on film. The reason we did shoot on film uh, on location is because we kind of wanted to commit, keep the look the same. Uh, one of the problems with sitcoms in the past, say if you looked at something like Last of Summer Wine, when you had a shot exterior on film, it all looked very nice and lovely, and then you'd see somebody open the door, and then you'd cut to the studio, and in they'd walk. The quality difference was so enormous that it was um, something we wanted to avoid. So, And outside shooting on tape was quite new, but we thought we wanted to try to keep the sort of general look of the same thing. In fact, Ed, it became the norm, didn't it? Shooting, yeah, it shooting comedy absolutely. on film. Even and, a couple and, of years yeah. after this yeah. was unheard of, you went, you went yeah. on to And actually, I don't really know anyone who shoots on film now these days unless they want to do it for an effect, um, because you can now shoot, you know, straight to disc and with film cameras, with Zeiss lenses and everything else. Very few people shoot on film now. Wait a minute. Danny Stevenson <coughs> said Bob Monkhouse had some of my jokes from Son of Cliché in his Tome of Jokes. Ah, did the he? bastard. The bastard. Bob yeah. collected jokes from wherever and ever he could find them. <laughs> there you go. Such is life. So um, that was a great ep, but a really tough one to do, wasn't it, guys, as my recollection went? Because we had those long dialogue scenes, which they had to get into their heads and had to learn, and that very tricky outside shooting, which I still have juddering dreams about every now and then. <coughs> um, I couldn't remember, Mike, did we shoot with one camera or did we have a couple of cameras out there on that day in, uh, when we were shooting the rubbish dump? Yeah, we had, uh, I think we had two or three cameras. I remember Wait. we're in a truck. Yeah, we're in a truck. And we had uh, one inch VT machines and cables from trucks mm -hmm. and uh, separate sound recording. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah. it was all, yeah. It was like a miniature version of shooting the golf. <laughs> mm -hmm. Miniature version of shooting the golf. Yes, quite, quite, yeah, yeah. 
It was like a ma like a massive sports OB, basically. Yeah, 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 but only scaled down a bit. And the difficulty of finding locations was we always had realised that we had to get the truck as close as possible because the other thing that degraded the picture was the length of the cable. Yeah. So, of yeah. course, you can't just lay like now where you can do a football match and you can lay a 1,000 yards of cable. You know, after 100 feet, the picture starts getting a bit... Yeah. 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 And it was tricky for the riggers, too, if it went for too far. And so, yeah. Donna, also a nightmare in that location, hauling everything onto the location, you uh, know, all the props and everything else. Uh, <laughs> and portal as well. She has to think about portal. A portal Everywhere. The makeup van, of yeah, makeup van and the wardrobe van. Right. Is that that need to just that we need to be thought as close as possible as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damien Coombe is asking, is there any equivalent of the showrunner in the SDS structure for Red Dwarf? The showrunner, guys, is really an American term. Uh, they've had them in America for many, many years, and it normally means the senior writer. Uh, Larry David was the showrunner on, on um, Seinfeld, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the guy who organises the creative vision. Uh, and we've never given writers quite that same importance within British comedy. Well, I'd say not officially, but certainly by um, season, series three, we, Doug and I were kind of... Well, you were executive producers, really. Yeah. I mean, we, we uh, before we became officially entitled producers, we would go up to uh, you know the, uh, the the scene people and whisper in their ear and they'd say no problem and just ignore you <laughs> because why well, you know they've got Mike telling them what to do, they've got Donna telling them what to do. There's a ranking system. They've and the writers are right. <laughs> the fact is, uh, the fact is, we've we've never, still to this day, we don't have a showrunner credit. No. Uh, in the UK, but the fact is, just about this time, I mean, again, we've talked about this before. When Ed and Rob and I worked on Carrots Lib, mm -hmm. we had seven writers permanently in the office, five days, six days a week. That was the, we had to create a new contract that didn't exist a writers' contract in the BBC mm -hmm. to be doing that. So during this period in the mid '80s, writers were becoming more and more influential in the production of their own work. I mean, in the old days, Roy Clark would give Sid Lotterby six scripts and he'd sit at home four months later and watch them on the television. That would be the end of it. Yeah. yeah. It isn't like that nowadays. Writers are much, much more important. It's normally expressed in credit terms by making them exec producers on their own shows. And showrunners, in fairness, were people who ran a collection of writers. So yes, ran a collection. Mean, they were the head writer, really. Yeah, yeah. So when I worked on something like my family, had, there would yeah. be about five, there would be about eight writers, but there'll be one guy who's in charge going, okay, who's, you know, we'll do this script this week, your idea, who's, you know, they kind of collect the script in terms of gags and story. They'd be kind of in charge. Da um, David Wallace is saying he gets the feeling that UK comedy is less built around the multiple writers approach, which is true. Yes. And it's more about an individual vision, which is not really true because the Americans, the, there is a guy at the top or a, a pair at the top who are, who are, everything goes through their typewriter. And they make the creative decisions. They tell people what jokes to, uh, what, what scripts to write, what stories to write. And uh, Paul's got a great story. Um, in America, um, after the, the sort of tech run, the writers just come from around the lots of various other programs because they're all sort of uh, in it together. And terrific writers will come and just give you three or four extra well, jokes. In pilot season, Rob, it's when pilot, when everybody's piloting on different days, all the other writers want the pilot to succeed because every new comedy that gets on, that's another comedy slot on the network. So in pilot season, all the writers... So, yes, and you were telling me about one particular pilot season where you saw a scruffy guy over in the corner. Well, we were doing, we were doing the American version of Royal Family, which was called First Family, F-U-R-S-T. Mm. Uh, and we were doing the book written by a lovely, lovely writer called Alan Zweibel, who was a regular Saturday, Live, Saturday Night Live contributor for many, many years. Uh, and it was Alan's script. And sure enough, on pilot day, seven or eight of these other writers turn up just to watch the run through and they will literally give him gags. So it's such a wonderful <laughs> thing. But on this particular day, uh, I was looking over in the corner and there was a shabby old bloke with a long cardigan and he was standing in the corner of the studio and he was just doing imaginary golf swings and I looked at him and it was Larry David and that <laughs> day on the front page of Variety the headline was third syndication round uh, of Seinfeld and Larry David had just made a quarter of a billion 
dollars that day. Could have got his hair cut. But still went in and did the gags for his mate. That's fantastic. He went in and did the gags for his mate. Exactly right. The, 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 the writing community is a, you know, it's competitive business. But when they're making pilots, they all want them to succeed and they come around and help where they can. Yeah, for sure. Collective business. Very good. If Redwood had been produced by ITV, well, it wouldn't have happened, would it? Because... We wouldn't have got series two. You'd never have got... You can't tell these stories in less than half an hour. You know, the biggest difference, I think, when the days when I was actively producing between ITV and BBC was those extra six minutes. And it may not feel like much, yeah. but it's yeah. massive. If you look at the complexity of a young one... It's like a third it's more. more. It's like a third more. Also, really, the ITV comedy is two long sketches. It's two 12-minute mm -hmm. sketches. Yeah. You have to build to a crescendo. Yeah. You have to, whereas with half an hour, you can spread and tell the story. So this wouldn't ever get done on, on uh, ITV. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I don't think you just simply don't have the time to be able to tell a story, say, as complex as the one we just saw today. No, we, that's what someone's saying. Which is a real you mystery. You lose six minutes out of that. Yeah, no, it, impossible. So. Yeah. Although we have sometimes recent... I have done sitcoms for the BBC where we have hideously overrun I'm thinking French and Saunders are particularly good at making it up on the day and I've, had, I've actually had shows where I've had to cut a third out of the show and it's just mm. really, really hard It's <laughs> horrible, it's but horrible But at least that's a sketch show, so you just lose a sketch but with a, with a narrative sitcom, very hard I know some of you are writers and trying to write, Molly often comments that she's writing, you just think Molly, if you're trying to tailor a script and you've got 30 minutes to tell your story or only 24 Big, big difference. Whole lot of compromise goes on on the ITV shows, which is why they're much more American. And you look at the American comedies, they're much quicker, they're much more gag driven. There's very little development of character or exposition of narrative. It's joke, 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 because that's all you can do in America in five, five minute segments. You know, it's lunatic. You, you, you couldn't in, in those in an American show get the depth of uh, no, no. pathos and uh, emotion that you get in, uh, in a BBC show. Mm -hmm. Guys, just to remind you, uh, I'm so glad we tipped you the wink last week because inevitably Waiting for God over tonight at seven o'clock sold out. So I hope those of you who wanted to got it early. Uh, we are delighted, I have to say, that we've sold out and for Royal Television. And, and thank you guys because you were the first rush and uh, got the, the whole thing going. You, you, you got in early. We sold a lot of tickets that Sunday afternoon. Donna, what were you going to say? Uh, I've worked on Waiting for God but they're all exchanged there round town. There you oh, see, there's no way you haven't been, Donna. There's no way you haven't been. Anyway, those of you who did get in early, I'll say, well, I'm glad we were able to give you the, the tip off and get you in before it officially <coughs> opened. See you at seven o'clock tonight. We're all. I, I uh, well, Paul and I both sat in on the rehearsal on Friday. Yeah. It's, it's special. It's stunning. It's, it's and not to give anything away. Not to give anything away. I've got away. a massive Q sheet and he's putting. You want Mike? Oh, you spoiled it! You know, she's got me in my car. Well, Mike, God, it doesn't turn up, Mike, did you say? No, I was just saying that, you know, with a cast on my leg, um, it's one of my one of my starring performances. I am God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you are God. Uh, those of you who are That's watching, up, send best wishes to Rob because he's got some bloody complicated cues that he wasn't expecting. He's got to cut in. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, then, do, do guys out there, do any of you know the Harlan Ellison story? I have no mouth and I must scream. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, next week, folks, we'll finish off series two by doing um, the Parallel Universe. And we will have a special guest with us featuring from Parallel Universe. And then the following week, we have a very special guest. We've been working. Drum roll, drum roll. On this one, drum roll. Are we going to announce, Rob? Yeah, let's announce. We do have Mr. Howard Goodall joining us. Um, uh, and we're going to do a music special. And we're going to do a music special. So you've been asking to see Howard for a long time, a lot of you. And oh, he's have, I, been... have I missed both of these then? Yes, Donna, you've missed the previous 11 shows that we've done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you only remember that because there's a naked man in it, Donna. <laughs> you, had to, you had to hold the towel for that bloke I in the shower. I've kept that secret for 10 years. I couldn't tell anybody. Well, <laughs> you were the naked man in the shower? No. But... <laughs> no I'd have remembered that, Paul. I the naked man in the shower. Remember we did it in the studio? And I was yeah. the one that was hiring all the extras. Yeah. And I asked, 
this uh, person, are you afraid of being naked? Oh, no, I'm not afraid. I can show everything. And then he turns up and he's a shivering wreck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We had to do it twice. Which was supposed to be closed. And all the electricians were going up into the uh, lighting. <laughs> looking down, laughing at him. Mm. And in the end, I had to hire a, a model, which cost a lot more money. Yeah. A model <laughs> <Because> in the <laughs> shower. And then the toilet in the shower in there. And yeah. could we stop him from turning around completely naked? No. No, no. Yeah. He, was, he was fine. You got he was proud. Yeah. yeah, he was proud. And he was actually rather good, the second guy. So it was probably... Yeah. He is actually very good, isn't it? He yeah, is it's a bit of rough justice. Listen, Donner and Mike, it has been so lovely to see you again. I haven't seen either of you for so many years, and it's been a pleasure. You both look absolutely wonderful. They both give starring appearances in the upcoming retrospectives, as, of course, inevitably does the very talented Mr. Bai. Uh, so look forward to that in August on on Dave, all of you, and hey, it is, and, and you forget we we it's great for us to see these guys yes, after all it these really is. years. Yeah, it's really nice to see you guys. Good so to I, see. You. I know I haven't said a lot of stuff, but this is what it was like day in and day out. Donna, all the guys would just go, yeah, 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 yeah. Donna, you've said far too much. Shut up, Donna. Shut up. Go and get the, no, the, the prop forms. <laughs> 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 Shut up, Donna. Have you filled in the health and safety? Where is where is the naked man you promised us, Donna? <laughs> what are you? Have you found the dump site yet, Donna? Really, Donna. Uh, Chris's H has fallen off. Have you got another one, please? Where's the jigsaw, Donna. Why haven't you finished the jigsaw? I have not finished it. You, you He's never not see. even joking. It would be fine if Paul was actually joking. I tell you, listen, nothing moved on that set. Michael even tell you it was his floor and it was Ed's gallery. Nothing yeah. moved on that set until Donald and Stefano said it was okay. Absolutely. No, we, we, we were poised but waiting for her to give us the green light. <laughs> All clear my end, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys, we must have a quick... that that you wrote. Guys, we're going to have a little party when all this is over for all yeah. the lockdown uh, participants. That would be great. We, we, now. we will see you there. What? Yeah, go on a, go on a day. So oh, lovely to see you, Mike, really. It's been really so long. Really nice to see you. See you, yeah. It's been too Thank long. You uh, Mike, we will, you will be invited. We will throw a party at the end of all this. Yeah. Thank you all for listening. See you next week. See a few of you later on this evening. All right. Okay. Take care now. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye. 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 Bye.